Ladies and gentlemen, I am Tosh Berman. This is Tosh Talks. I have two other people on this couch with me. <laughs> on the far, far, my far right, maybe your left, we have Erwin Wynn. Yes. And then we have Joe Barardi. Yes. I can't say names correctly, especially the last names, okay? Yes. Because mm -hmm. I usually Perfect. messed up. I usually mess up those that can be tough. Yeah. It can be okay. tricky. Yeah, it's it's okay. the accent, if it's accented or work, I'm sure mm -hmm. is that. And Joe? Yes. I have known you for many, many years, decades actually. Yeah, decades. Definitely. I have known your presence, but we actually, I actually didn't know you until very recently, really. That's true, yeah. But I, I know who you are, and I think I first saw you at a record store that you may have worked at in the 80s. That's where we first met. So I, used to, I used to hang out there. Yeah, you were um, a regular mm -hmm. and uh, one of the good, good regulars. We had a lot of regulars, some of them were. Crazy and uh, do you remember re recommending me a Pacific record that I bought? um no I don't either uh, yeah <laughs> I don't have that recollection because I mean though but I, think... I definitely remember talking to you a lot yes you know about stuff that's about everything you know because you were you know interested in music and so it was I and, but it was fun working there. It's a really fun... Um, For me, it was great because it was just around the corner where, where I lived at the time. Oh, okay. So I was just, I just roll out of bed oh, and there there you were. That's great. You were like a trap audience or a trap person because you worked. Because I had a big yeah. thing that yeah. you work. But it was, a, it was a great place to work. And especially that, you know, it was Melrose in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there was so much going on in the street. It was fun. It was really fun. So... Technically, you're a drummer. Yeah. Uh, technically and um, untechnically, I'm a drummer, yeah. I always feel calling this a drummer is not, it's a, it's a, it's a really a small description of what you do. Well, I'm a musician, so. That's better. Uh, drums is, is my main outlet. Yes. I'd say. But, but, um, but I do all, play other instruments and, you know, do all kinds of th stuff, music related because yeah. I feel like your drums are like the foundation a percussion foundation and you sort of build other things on top of it you mean me personally or in music in general you personally as a drummer yeah because you, 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 well, you use the other element there's other elements in your work yeah that's true that is true I mean I started out as, as just straight up as a drummer you know mm -hmm. playing drums and then um, always interested in other sounds though so even from a you know earlier age i was intrigued by percussion you know mm -hmm. adding percussion to a drum kit so kind of started like that and then later on you know like uh, sort of college age i started playing piano and uh took some classes at the community college music classes mm -hmm. and stuff i didn't have any musical training you know, you know so can, training. can you read music i can yeah, so I can. you can read scores yeah. and i didn't start out that mm -hmm. way though um you know, like I said, I didn't have any lessons or didn't play in the high school band because the high school didn't have a band mm -hmm. that I went to. And uh, so, um, yeah, I just self-taught and then I got a little bit of actual like reading music. And and actually the reading the music started with when I started taking piano lessons at the mm -hmm. college. Uh, that, that really kind of helped because drum music is pretty boring and pretty is it? written written well i mean it's boring it, it's mm -hmm. uh it's only rhythms i mean you do you do mm -hmm. have pitches in mm -hmm. terms of different you know different if you're just playing drums it would be you know you, each drum has its own pitch and so, and so it is there is pitch involved but but um it's much more of a yet you know, yet yeah, you say that yet yeah <laughs> what i've heard though i didn't actually hear you doing this but i've heard you actually either, you redid the drum solo in Jenner Baker's Cream's Toad. Oh, I, I did. How'd you hear about that? Did I tell you? Oh. No, I do really in-depth research. Wow, good, that's great. Little things about your life you don't know. You no, know that I don't even know. <laughs> and Erlen's here to testify to... Uh, this is true. This is true, I have right? been Joe's neighbor for many years prior. And yeah. I have experienced a lot of things that are not documented that Joe Berardi <laughs> has performed. <laughs> <laughs> Including Tom. Luckily, they're not documented. But uh, <laughs> um, so how do you no, how, how do you 
transcribe or read. Well, here's the thing with that. Uh, I, I guess I should explain it. Mm -hmm. I guess it's interesting. I don't know. It's interesting it's, to me. I found it fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. Continue. Um, mm -hmm. Mark Doton, who plays bass with me in Double Knot Spy Car, mm -hmm. and uh, he has a, his own recording studio. Mm -hmm. So he got hired for a job and uh, with some people that were doing a kind of a low budget film, and they <clears throat> had a fight scene in the middle of the film, and they had sort of um, used as a temp track, you know, typical for films, and just grab music. Uh, they used the drum solo in Toad, you know, Cream, mm -hmm. Toad, Ginger Baker's drum solo. And so they really got got married to, which happens all the time, they got really attached to the, the sound of that with the scene. <clears throat> it worked really well for them. So we, um, so they hired Mark to, hey, we want to, we can't license the cream uh, song, because the cream recording, it's too expensive, but we can license the composition. You know, that, you know, mm -hmm. works, you know I'm sure you guys know. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so you can, you know, it's like a song, if you, if you want to do a Beatles song, you can cover it, you can mm -hmm. sing it on your own, and then you just pay for the song, you don't pay for the, the recording, right. the mm -hmm. master recording. Totally separate. Anyway. So, so it's like, okay, um, so Mark knew that I was a Ginger Baker fan from way back. And the thing about it is, is that at, since I was a kid and first started playing, I used to listen to that drum solo all the mm -hmm. time. And it's really long. It's probably 10 minutes long. Too long for me. It's, yeah, too long for most people. <laughs> and the funny thing, though, when I was, you know, I was probably 14, 15, I, um, uh, you know, my mom was really supportive. This is getting off the track a little bit, but mm -hmm. my mom was supportive of my playing music. And um, so I actually, you know, this is how great a mom I, I have. <laughs> is that I sat her down and made her listen to Toad, the entire thing. And she sat and listened to like all mm -hmm. 10 or so minutes of it. Can you imagine? It's so sweet. And she listened to the whole thing and went, yeah, that's great. I gotta go, you know, do anything else. <laughs> was, your, was your mother a musician? She wasn't, but my father was. Your father was a musician. My father was a musician. What kind of musician was he? Um, he played in um, in uh, big bands in, in New York. He was a trumpet player. Uh -huh. So he played in the 40s, 50s. Um, mm -hmm. He played in big bands, but he passed away when I was just a, a baby, oh. just an infant. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know him personally, mm -hmm. uh, just his sort of, you know, legacy as it were. But he was, um, you know, a, a player in the uh, in New York. You know, that's what, that's mm -hmm. the music that was happening. Was big bands, and he was a trumpet player. So, you know, he just was a working musician. So my mom understood what that was about, and um, you know, uh, so that's she could she knew my you know my sort of passion, mm -hmm. understood it, and wanted to be supportive. But she also knew the struggle to make a living. That you know, trying to to be a musician as a career, a how, hard, how hard that is, mm -hmm. you know, so she hadn't fully understood that. Especially when you're going to reproduce. When, you know, all time. I wanted to do was play Toad. You know, so. <laughs> so there's that. But thing. anyway, so, um, so, so just to finish the, mm -hmm. the backstory of how this, so Mark, uh, you know, he knew, uh, he, he called me up and he knew that I had a, an interest in Ginger Baker. So he, he said, uh, can you, can you do Toad, you know, can mm -hmm. we, can we do some version of it? And I was like, yeah, I absolutely can do it. I hadn't tried to play it in, you know, since, since I was a teenager, but, um, mm -hmm. but I kind of listened to it and, you know, and then, you know, we were, we could, it was just me in the studio so we could kind of piece it together oh, because it was hard to, I couldn't play it from top to bottom and be really precise because mm -hmm. they were, you know, they wanted, um, they wanted it to match what they were hearing. Mm -hmm. So, I had, and it was also an edited version because it, they didn't use the whole thing. Right. So it was probably like five minutes out of uh -huh. the ten. So I had to sort of learn their version, their edit of the, of the solo, mm -hmm. and it was super fun. And it was hard and challenging and all that stuff. And we did it, and we all got paid. And then at the end, they said, "Oh, it turns out we can." We can actually license the green <laughs> version, so we're not going to need yours. But so your nothing ever happened to it. It was much better. <laughs> no, it wasn't better. So, it wasn't better at all. But it was. It was. 
respectable. So is it your interpretation of that piece, or do you were you trying to do exactly? I was trying to I was trying to do it uh, as close as I could get. That's mm -hmm. interesting. And I wasn't always completely accurate, but I, I got I mean I got the the, the gist of it. Okay. And we tried to we tried to actually make it sound you know the recording uh -huh. quality tried to. You know, I mean, you can't duplicate it. It's done in 60, whatever. For but my ears, I always feel drummers are totally unique. I don't feel like a drummer can imitate another drummer. So I was really, sh I was really surprised to hear that you attempted to do, not your interpretation, but your actual reproduction yeah, I mean, of, was, of, uh, of, of uh, Ginger's iconic solo. Yeah. Tone. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't easy and it wasn't exact, but it was... Um, so it was kind of an interpretation, but I really wanted to get it as close as I could. You should do a whole album of you doing exact <laughs> reproduction of famous drummers, like one John Solos, yeah. famous drummers. Like yeah, like wow. me, like you know, made like five pieces on the album. You imagine. Because everything would be different. Like Ginger Baker, Gene Cooper, mm -hmm. Keith Moon. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. But Keith Moon. Well, of course, Keith Moon never did solos, uh -huh. but um, oh, he kind of did solos. Throughout all the songs, he soloed all the time. Yes, he, that was his he style. Is, his, he is the lead drummer. He, he definitely is the lead drummer. His famous <laughs> quote is, uh, "I'm the best Keith Moon sounding drummer there is ever." Yeah. So, and he's right. <laughs> um, your father. So your father played in a big band. Yeah. Jazz. Yeah. The the little bits of work I've heard of yours. Your work is very orchestrated in a sense in, in the band context. And I, when when he told me this, I did know your father was playing in a big band. And listening to your, some of your music, I I could see the connection really? in a very vague way. Oh. But I just feel in big band, there's like a place and time for everything in the context of all those musicians. Yeah, it's highly arranged. Yeah, for sure. And I feel yeah. a lot of the music that you play in various bands, though not large in number. But it's very well, tightly arranged works and very disciplined. Yeah, that that's that is true. I, I and I like that. I you know for some reason I gravitate towards that. I can't say it's um, has anything to do with my father and his mm -hmm. background. Um, you know, when I was a kid, um, that music was really corny to me, and I didn't. Right. I wasn't into it at right. all. Um, you know, it was like it was close enough to. You know, when I was growing up, that it was, it was not definitely not cool. Right. Um, whereas now, I mean, there. You know, if, I don't know if you remember. It was probably twenty years ago, but the the sort of swing revival. I remember and every second. Fans were, you, yeah, because you know, I, I know that he was out there cutting a rug. Oh my god! I, I was dancing like crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so, you know, that whole sort of 40s swing yes. sound came back in, in a retro way, but retro, like people who weren't even born then. Right. Born second hand news. Yeah. Yeah. Like definitely. For the next generation. Second, yeah, like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like rockabilly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the, in the 80s, rockabilly came back and mm -hmm. ska never went away and, and heavy metal. Yeah. To be it will never go. We'll it just, there's always a new generation that yeah. that rediscovers it and re reinvents it. I, I have always been curious. Have you ever actually seen like a like a forty style big band or, or remember your father playing live in a big band? Well, I don't know. I don't remember my father because he, like I said, he died when I was young. But um, but I heard um, like probably when I was in high school, I heard some some of the local, I grew up in Florida, and it's, you know, mm -hmm. smaller city, not a tiny city, but, um, and there were like local, uh, and one guy owned a music store, and he was from that era, mm -hmm. you know, and he, so they used to have these outdoor concerts, and I would go, just because I was interested in music, and, you know, we, you know, me and my friends would go, and, ha you know, halfway like, admire their skill, and then mm -hmm. the other half was like just completely making fun of it. How isn't this, you know, corny? Because I never actually heard big but, band music live. I only know it through like old recordings. Right. So my interpretation. Which, uh, and excuse me, but yeah. the, um, those recordings were done in the 40s, maybe 50s, yeah. and they're not really high five. No. So you don't really get to hear. Mm -hmm. the, the impact of uh, that's what I'm missing because I'm wondering like the impact must have been I'm thinking back through like 
somewhere like the Palladium or or some like yeah. venue that really focus on big band orchestration coming in and you know these huge dances having a really <clears throat> live band of like 30 people must have been like really kind of, I, I imagine it being like an overpowering yeah and I think it would like it's a, comparable to hearing a rock band live mm -hmm. especially you know when you're young and you haven't heard mm -hmm. a rock band that much or something you know it, it was powerful I mean, definitely powerful and it was all acoustic and um, but a big sound and had a big impact. And it was also, you know, the other thing about that, generally that style, um, the commercial aspect of it was, it was dance music. Right. Yeah. So it was a combination of this powerful band, but also you would dance to it. So, Have you heard the yeah. Brian Ferry Orchestra? No. It's an interesting project. He basically, what he did was he took all, some solo, but a lot of Roxy music <laughs> songs. Really? And rearrange it in a big band style, but a very 1930s style. And really? oh. when you listen to the record, it sounds like 78s. Oh, they're sort of totally, totally retro. Everything is totally retro. Oh, wow. And oh, I never heard that. And one I find it interesting is that he actually went that far to make it retro, like he made his music vintage. Mm -hmm. Right. But also, what we think of recordings, not like live music. Like, I was wondering right. if you ever heard the Brian Ferry Orchestra play live, it's going to sound so different from... Yeah, and it wouldn't sound as, as unique and interesting, mm -hmm. probably. So this, is, so this is like, this is like a, definitely like a record project, you know? It's right. not like a, a, right. It's mm -hmm. not a live thing. It's and he never performed it. No, he yeah. arranged it or helped you get, you know, art director. Or, yeah, <laughs> it's I'm a sure. Brian Ferry sure Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think exactly Duke Ellington, but... Yeah, yeah. But the idea of making a record of that, of something of that era, what we think is the sound of that era, you know, and it's, uh, I find that really interesting. Yeah, it is, and, and it's, it's a kind of fun thing to do, mm -hmm. and I, I think people, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of interesting, to, the idea, like, what if Roxy music started in the 40s instead of the 70s? I think it is, know? I think in his head, Brian Ferry was always in the like, 40s. Yeah, that's true, mm -hmm. I mean, visually, certainly, mm -hmm. and, um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting approach and concept, and it's fun. And it's fun. It almost you know relating to the the little Ginger Baker solo thing. Mm -hmm. We we did try to kind of get the kind of '60s quality. Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't really that successful in that regard, but um, but we tried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it's almost like the '40s sound is so so specifically a certain kind of sound and pretty narrow. Mm -hmm compared to, you know, modern recording quality. Uh, that's a very specific thing. And, uh, we, you know, we weren't slavish about it. We just thought, we just let's try to make it sound like that. You know, it's like, another thing I heard from you, your Billy Joel piece. You did? Yes, very impressive. <laughs> that's funny. You working with a Billy Joel recording Quote unquote. But yeah, well, I think it's, it's a Billy Joel record, right? It's a Billy Joel record. What it is, it's on YouTube. Yeah. You just look up here under your name, and it's you using a Billy Joel 12 inch disc, and you're like shaking it from a mic, I think, and then you make yeah. a loop of it, a live, maybe exactly. it's live, yeah. and then you add all this other electronic effects on it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all. Advice. But still, you have arrangement skill that's very well. It fits okay. in like that, so that makes sense. I mean, that's kind of an example of what you're talking about. Then, I mean, I don't think about it, but when you say it, you know, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. I guess he's right. Yeah. I just thought um, your, your, for your your his, musical history and your experience, your yeah. improvise. Like, if I did improvisation, it'd be really all over the place. So I'm not that disciplined. But you have a, a really great discipline yeah. in, in making this thing work. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I say thank you because I think that's a plus. Some people might think that. I mean, a, a, some a people plus. might think that's a, a detriment. They're wrong. To though. improv, they're you know? totally wrong. Well, good. <laughs> they're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but um, well, like you know, uh, 
you guys saw on Credo, which is me and Kira. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, me and Kira's long-standing you know, music mm-hmm. project. And we, you know, we do um, various times we've done a lot of improv, but it's very much a compositional thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it started out that way, especially at the beginning. Um, but we, you know, eventually branched out and it's like, let's improvise. But we both have that same mindset. So when we like to improvise, um, sort of like spontaneous compositions is how mm-hmm. we look at it, as mm-hmm. opposed to, and a lot, you know, like I say, a lot of people will think, well, that's, you know, you, uh, improvisation should be much more free and open and mm-hmm. formless. And, and that is a, a sort of one approach you could take to it, but that's not. And I've done plenty of stuff that's like that, and I enjoy it. But it's personally, I think, I find it more satisfying to have some form, some sense of form. Or a foundation. I, I can't, I can't get away from that. So I sense that in, my, I sense in your work. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's great. Um, also, you brought some objects here, which I sort of tie in with the Billy Joe piece because you're using like well, like, sort of like <clears throat> toy keyboards and plastic. Yeah, I like. I, I enjoy those kind of cheap sounds and um, well, on that on that video there's, there's definitely some of that incorporated so what is uh, this you brought what are, what, what's in front of us i brought a couple i do circuit bending you know which is take apart um uh sound circuits mm-hmm. take them apart and tweak the circuit board add components and uh, make it do do something different mm-hmm. and usually way more interesting than it was in, initially intended so that's that's what circuit bending is. I didn't invent it by any means, but I have heard of it. It's it's a whole thing. It's and especially now, but it's, it was cool because when I first started, um, it was it was quite a while ago, and I just found online, you know, found out information about it. It was intriguing to me. I I had always been intrigued by mm-hmm. electronics, but I I thought you had to, I thought you had to know something about it, so. It's like, I'd like to do that, but I don't know anything about it. So I kind of stayed away. And then this, this kind of opened it up for me to like, no, you don't need to you know, have any, any training at all. Mm-hmm. It's like music, you know, you can play music. You don't need to go mm-hmm. to music school. Uh, and so this, is a, this was sort of an end to electronics for me that I gradually evolved into building uh, guitar effects pedals and mm-hmm. you know, sort of noise boxes. And, and so now I'm a, I'm a full-fledged, amateur electronics <laughs> wizard uh, no i just really like like the uh the, oh yeah so yeah, anyway some examples. this is a yeah this is an aerial doll let's see now um and so did you paint her i did yeah. oh nice color she choice. has arms and legs mm. and bright red long hair but i mm. i figured all that was just a incumbent incumbent <laughs> this is all we care She's really um, transcended the uh, corporal. Mm. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but ask her a question. Who are you? My name's Ariel. It's nice to meet you. Is it? No, it's her. <laughs> Is that your voice? Um, you'll no. be my ventriloquist. <laughs> <Tell me. laughs> I have to practice. Look, we both have each other. I can't do it. I don't know what she's <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry, I'm very that's, much annoyed with okay. this. <laughs> that's all right. Um, well, yeah, that's not you. No, it's that's, no, Joe. It's, it's this. So, so I added a couple of components. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> Do you have a name for it? No, it's Ariel. It's Ariel. <laughs> 
I have done, I use that for some of the props. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I sold it, I, I make, I sell all this stuff, so. You do? I sold it to several friends, friends of friends. Are there people who collect them? Is like an object in um, the sound, or they use it for their work? I, most people are interested for the sound. For the sound, so they use yeah. it. They use it for their company. yeah. Like uh, Nels Klein has one. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna Hamler has you know. Uh huh. Yeah. She has one. Um, my friend Harry Cloud just bought one. So yeah, they were they totally were interested in using it, actually using it on stage and stuff. So. How long have you been doing this? On oh, this one too. Yeah, What's this I've one? Seen this oh, <clears throat> well, I've been doing it for I don't even know, like ten or twelve years, something like mm. that. This is a just a rhythm box, but I put a pitch. <laughs> so it's kind of like, Exactly. <laughs> it's Jim that, Baker's toad. It's it's that is that is toad program. It's programmed it in. Wow. Sounds so, just like it. So, are you in a regular band? Regular band? No. Are you in a Pacific band? Uh, irregular, regular. mostly. Irregular. irregular. Yeah, Double on Spy Car is is uh, is my um, main. Uh, you know, ongoing performing band. You know, like as I mentioned, Non Credo is mm -hmm. me and Kira Bowman. Mm -hmm. That's ongoing as well. We don't play that much though. And, um, you know, so it's not this. You saw us. Yeah, we saw you at, at um, the volleyball. Volleyball. I was there. You were there. Too. Yes. Well, I didn't know you back then. No. You didn't? Really? No. No. Oh, that's funny. We didn't know oh. each other. That's funny. I don't remember who. I just figure everybody knows each other. <laughs> and you did a version of uh, Can's uh, Vitamin C. We did, yeah. Or vitamin yeah. C. Vitamin C. Vitamin C. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really fun one to do. I mean, we love Can. and um, There's not that many songs that, that we would want to cover by them. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's one of them because it's, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's very melodic. And, and it's it, just a great song. That was the first time I ever heard the song, your version. Oh, it, oh really? really? Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. That's that's good. It's a great song. Yeah, it really is. It's a great what, what you did with yeah. it. And, and well, the song is great. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for sure. Yeah. So is this okay? This is double. But this is Spy double not spy car. This is my. We play pretty regularly, mm -hmm. um, and this is the last thing we put out uh, about a year and a half ago. A year, something like I can't remember. So the name of the uh, CD album is Move. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a little bit of an unusual record for us it's um double knot spy car is a uh, quartet <clears throat> like two guitars mm -hmm. bass and drums one guitar player plays lap steel uh -huh. you know like, uh, sort of you have a lot of guest stars but this is Your a friend. guest record each song mm -hmm. has uh, a guest artist mostly guitar players but not mm -hmm. exclusively so each song has the band plus a guest so you have ben and Ben Vaughn is on that. He's on uh, and Nils Klein. Nils Klein, uh, Mike Watt. These are the these are the big guys. The heavy stuff. Yeah, heavy setters. Wow. But the uh, there's a lot of people that are not as familiar mm -hmm. names that are great, of course. And uh, I haven't heard this, but I saw you live. Maybe was it for was it for this? Like um, for this? Yeah. And the music struck me as uh, kind of uh, soundtracky. Spy themes. Yes, yeah, that's definitely an influence. Little ventures type of tornadoes thing. Little Joe Meekish aspect, but a very yeah. kind of uh, played in a very uh, uh, I don't want to use complex, but a, but a, a different texture. It's yeah, textural, right. Well, we're not we're not we're not 
Speaking of, we're not trying to be retro no. you know, or anything like that. No. Because all those things you mentioned might imply that. But those are influences. Yeah. Certainly all the soundtrack stuff, you know, Morricone, um, everything, you know, that, that has that, that sort of a cinematic mm -hmm. atmosphere. Uh, that, that's the thing. We just try to create an atmosphere for each piece. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so it's very arranged, very, uh, I mean, we do, we have like solos, you mm -hmm. know, kind of traditional guitar solos within some of the songs, but a lot of them are just, it's just an arrangement. So and, uh, as far as I know, which not, I don't know anything, as far as I know, it's a, it's a same, <laughs> but, but, but I'm interested in like, it seems like every band you're with, or made music with the people you made. It's always sort of not like great rock and roll. It's always like has a cinematic appeal or sort of a. Um, um, it's like exploring another world. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I guess I end up being attracted to the, those bands because of that, you know, mm -hmm. or. Uh, and then hopefully I bring some, my share to that. But, it, it, you know, in this case, everybody in the band is interested in that, mm. musically interested in that. Um, and it just the bands that I end up playing in, uh, that's, you know, I, mean, I do a lot of uh, music projects, um, other people's music, you mm -hmm. know, like they'll hire me or whatever. And, uh, you know, so it's not everything, everything I do is not going to be as... No, but you even work, you even work interesting with... Interesting as that. A standard way. You work with Stan? Yeah, well, Stan is the same. And he's a person who's also yeah. has that foundation yeah, that explores absolutely. into other worlds. Well, the thing with Stan, it's a well known story if you follow you know, his whole history with Wall of Voodoo and all mm -hmm. of The story is they started out as a soundtrack company. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, if you were called. But, uh, yeah, they wanted him and Mark Moreland, the guitar mm -hmm. player, um, they wanted to create this, you know, band or just musicians getting together to do uh, to do film soundtracks mm. and um, so that's that's how and then it evolved into Wall of Wood so, mm. you know a rock band but um, yeah so that that's their foundation was as a soundtrack Garland was a neighbor did you know he was what he was up to or because I I think you'd be I think that like what it'd be like if you're my neighbor would love to be your wow. neighbor. I see. I'm not sure if I would love that or not. <laughs> Joe was very She's helpful. very quiet. I was very quiet, but Joe was very helpful at times because I always had issues with my own other neighbors that were surrounding me in a rowdy neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I was making clothes at the time, and there was one time when I couldn't get my dress off. It was poorly designed, so it <laughs> couldn't. Right. It couldn't take it That's off funny. properly. So you call your neighbor. Joe, yeah, is that it? it's the closest person. I'm not going to ask, you know, the people right underneath me. Of course not. But no, you ask your neighbor to have the help her take her dress off. It's not a request. My other neighbors have never asked me that. We we saw the crucifixion together. Yeah, this is in Highland Park, and um, yeah. on this at the time, the street I lived on mm -hmm. had a had the crucifixion for Easter. What was it? Easter. Good Friday. Good Friday. Yeah, I'm the next guy. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Bow your head, <laughs> sorrow. Uh, anyway, so so uh, yeah, you know, we went and sat in, in my front yard and we could watch the crucifixion. Oh, it was great. Yeah, they re reenact every year, I believe. Yeah, right? still do. But otherwise, we had a very nice time as neighbors because he would say, "Come over, let's listen to music and eat ice cream." He's very gentle. Mm. He loves rock and roll, but he's very gentle. <laughs> I like ice cream, too. You get frozen yogurt. Mm -hmm. But originally we met because Joe is or was a patron of Videotech. Right, that's right. A yeah. Francophile's dream <laughs> for renting French New Wave films. And we both have a mutual friend, Mark, who worked there. And Mark knew Joe, too. And so we all knew each other in the neighborhood. And then Joe and I found out we lived very close to each other, but block, what, two blocks over? Yeah. And he was the one person I could talk to. The one? The one. One could take your dress off. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was very hot 
No, it's totally here. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was very it's stuffy. Hot. It was very stuffy. It was summer. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get the dress up, and I don't know how you. Probably, I know how that you is. You probably yeah. don't have this issue, but I know that <laughs> I think a lot of women do if they wear something that's. I would say maybe poor, not just poorly tailored. Mm -hmm. Maybe the material doesn't have stretch, and this didn't. It's very hard to take something off suddenly. It doesn't fit over yeah. your shoulders, and so I was struggling, and it just became more and more heat, oh. and nobody was there. So I said, "Good job." Are you home? He said, I'm home. He's like, can I rush over? I need you to take off my clothes. Because <laughs> I can't take it off. Did you yoke this outside the window? <laughs> Pardon? Did you yoke this out the yeah, window? Yeah. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually had a... I think I drove because it was just... You had to it's drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're an incredible neighbor. That's pretty amazing. I, you know, I, I do a lot for my friends. <laughs> it's very so, interesting. We have a similar taste. We all like... French New Wave films. That's true. Uh, yeah, that's Go to your house. We have you, a lot of... You have all the guitar um, stuff. Guitar... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Too, right? yeah. I was actually yeah. just looking at Godard postcards somebody has sent me. They sent me one. Really? Yeah. That's really cool. Nice. That's but really cool. I think another thing Joe and I have in common is another musician, Richard. Which one? Rich West? Yes, Rich West. That's true. And he was um, Joe's neighbor. Hmm. That became my landlord later on, but he has a bookstore, a used bookstore. What's the name of the bookstore? The Battery. The Battery? Battery. I've never been there. Pasadena. Mm -hmm. Pasadena. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's so great we shop. all like French New Wave and books. Yeah. And music. So people who are watching, they should go to the Battery. <laughs> they should go to the Battery. Right, yeah. They should listen to Double Nut Spy Car. Yes. Buy all the merchandise. Yes. I'm usually the merch girl. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, there's no sure. cut I take. No I'm cut. just there to support yeah, the band. She's just a non-profit worker. No profit. Yeah. Charity. Charity. We're charity. We take her. We can take her back by <laughs> taking her dress off. When we're <laughs> yeah. it, it all works out in the end. Yeah, it works out. Right. Well, we met, we actually, first time we ever met was at a spy hunt. Because Mark brought you to it. Is yeah, right? because we knew of each other, but I never met you. Right. And then Mark says, so, you have to meet Joe. Yeah. So we went to Tex. Yeah. And we met you. And then I just yeah, then started getting French, no, not French yogurt, um, frozen yogurt. Frozen, frozen. <laughs> French frozen yogurt. Mmm, <laughs> yeah. so No, Menchies, we're very corporate. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. I don't know all about music, but I know what I like. Well, the thing about Orlando, <laughs> Sorry, if I may, I don't, yeah. <laughs> Do you need to wrap up? Or no, no, we can go for another hour. Just for another, another moment. Hour. Yeah. We're getting there. We're getting, we're getting. Um, uh, what was I going to say? The thing about, about you is that, you know, you're, or Lin Wen, is that uh, even though she's a couple of years younger than, than, than Tosh and, and I, uh, she really is, no, she's quite a bit younger, but she's <laughs> super uh, knowledgeable about, you know, all kinds of things in general, yeah. But music that we would love and probably yes. since we were kids, she knows about all that yes. stuff, and that's rare, you know. I mean, it's not completely rare because everything is out there for people now. Mm -hmm. But you really are well, well versed, and knowledgeable about stuff. I mean, I'll make these references that you, you just know, and it, it sometimes surprises me because, like, how do you know that? But you do. So that's well, that's a very uh, that's a very noble. I, I find that very trait. suspicious. Thank you. That's suspicious? Inspiring. Do you think she's well, a lot older than she looks? Not that. It's like, <laughs> like she has this knowledge just automatically. Well, the strange thing was that you're like 63. When, yeah, I'm 63, etc. It goes consecutively. Uh, <laughs> isn't that cute? Anyway, what was I saying? We met 10 years ago, and 10 years really? ago, we didn't really have. Well, it was you nine were 12, and a half. You were 12 or Shut up. <laughs> we met. We didn't have YouTube and everything, and I don't even use a lot of these technology kind of things to like find music. Mm. So back then, the way that we met, having similar interests, was just because of CDs and records and recommendations from others. Whereas yeah. now, I think people that are 18, they can yes. just look on There's, their smartphone yeah. and do it. But back then, it was still There's a little a lot bit more. You gotta research a little bit simpler. You have to know. You have to be in the know to know to yeah. know. No. But you have to you have to want to know too, like you you know you have a inquis inquisitive mind and you want to know what's out there that's good, and I think a lot of people, you know, aren't as adventurous. That's no, in their mm -hmm. tastes or 
I think that that's more like a product of the more recent years because now people can only stick to their genre <coughs> what they like with yeah. Spotify or Pandora. And it's actually probably better to only have things like radio and so on. So you're exposed to things that you don't like, but you can then form an opinion as to what yeah, you don't like. Yeah, like less options are mm -hmm. maybe better. Mm -hmm. I believe so. As long as you get the good stuff, of which course. you did, then you're, yeah. you're good. You know, I was it's very fortunate. Yeah. I've been redeemed. Yeah. So, it's okay. So, yeah. You have to work with your limits. There are no limits anymore. That's true. <laughs> I made there, are no limits. <laughs> there are no limits. <laughs> Only the outer limits. <laughs> right. All right. So this is Tosh Berman, Tosh Talks, with Joe, Carolyn. Yes. Yeah. And next time I'm going to invite you back in when we have a special guest, Jean Luc Godard. Is he going to be here? Yeah. I'll kind of have him as a guest. This is going to be great. Yeah, I'll be here. I'll be here. Can Anna Karina? How about Anna Karina? Yeah. Can, Can we get her? Can we get her? <laughs> um, please, please. I'm not, I'm not sure what the relationship between Jean Luc and. Well, maybe, yeah, that yeah, might be a problem. Maybe I, separate. I have an idea. Mm. Don't tell either of them that they're oh, each other coming. That's wow. a great idea. <laughs> it is. It really is. Can you imagine? Imagine the drama. That would be a first. <laughs> on Tosh Talks. That would be a scoop on Tosh Talks. That would get me at least three extra viewers, at if least. not more. <laughs> I would take this thing straight into the <laughs> International Space Station. There's only up from now on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>